You'd think we'd know the basic facts about the history of the cinema. After all, it only happened 70 years ago. Well, we don't. We don't know who did the first close-up or the first trick film. We don't really know who began the idea of simple storytelling or who did the first color film. Come to that, we don't even know for sure exactly who invented it. sort of involved with the whole idea of the sort of pioneer film movement in Britain right from the start. Um, he was always interested. I mean, my childhood consisted of going off and standing outside people's houses, you know. We stood outside Robert Paul's house in Muswell Hill and we went to try and find the places where Cecil Hepworth shot his films and you know, stood on the beach at Hove saying this is the place where um, G.A. Smith filmed so, I mean, that's what we did. That was what our life consisted of as a child. But kind of before my time, he'd already established relationships with people like G.A. Smith in particular, um, who had been a bit forgotten. I mean, this we're talking about the 1960s, I suppose. And at that kind of time, the interest in those pioneer filmmakers of Britain were not, was not high on anybody's radar. His record, his catchbooks and on a very battered old tape recorder, we documented a few reminiscences. I was making black and white pictures in 1897. What sort of subjects did you begin with? Natural subjects, like rough seas and uh, things of that sort, you know. And then I got on to comedies. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in fact, I, I rather kept to comedies. I had a, a pretty good life. I mean, William Fries Green, for example, we only used to go and stand outside his, um, his rather grand monument in Highgate Cemetery because he definitely had passed on, but still it was something we did as a family. We went to have a look at William Fries' Greens too. Um, so I suppose he may have had a part in resurrecting the interest in these people that after all were making films before the whole concept of film barely existed. Yes, so my father did have the luck to interview a huge number of wonderful pioneers, uh, not just the really early phase that we've talked about, but um, I mean Harold Lloyd made a big impression on him. I've still got his signed copy of his autobiography where Harold Lloyd has drawn in his glasses, his trademark. Um, you know, but also people like Orson Welles and, and uh, Buster Keaton and and even people from the later period, uh, this cast of cabaret with, was, 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 was somebody who we went out for dinner with one night, I remember. I think the pioneers um, were interesting to him just because they were kind of rare and rare. And I think they also tapped into his interest in amateurs and the work that he did with amateur filmmakers. My father was by no means a filmmaker. Whilst we do have a few films in our collection where he's shot the material himself, he was doing it more as a exercise in archiving, although he would have used that word, but that's what he was doing, rather than completing a film project or editing in any way. But he did actually run film schools on behalf of the British Institute that he was working with at the time. It was a summer school and he did a lot of these summer schools teaching amateurs how to make better films. And he had very close relationships with quite a lot of people that he met and taught during that period. I think it was called Bellstead House. There was a house in the country where they used to go off and make a film in a week. Um, and, you know, people like Dr. Michael Essex Supresti remained a lifelong friend and indeed he was a collector of medicine films and he donated his entire collection to us eventually. And people like Richard Jackson, who was a theatrical agent, um, and my father made contact with him during that period, um, it, it brought him a great network of amateur filmmakers. Even though he didn't do a huge amount of filmmaking himself, he was certainly in contact with all the amateur uh, filmmakers that were Graham Murray would be another really important person that he worked with during this period and 
I think what for me what's so wonderful is these amateurs are out there making an amazing film, some of them incredibly good quality, indistinguishable from the professionals I think in many cases, might be making them on an eccentric gauge like 9.5 but still the quality is stunning. And then when they've all come to retire, like the Spence collection and certainly Graham Murray, the collections have ended up here. So that kind of legacy from him teaching way back in the 1950s has sort of all come back to us, which I'm grateful for. I mean, he was a man that really believed in living life to the full. And I know that sounds a bit of a hackneyed term, but he threw himself with such energy at all of life, you know, it didn't matter what he was engaged in and I, I think that kind of energy and passion it, it is probably part of his legacy that I remember most. We were very, very close, I mean we had that classic eldest daughter father relationship and um, we, would ha we had to really to be able to bring the archive together I suppose. Um, we, we actually decided on, f on founding the archive together back in 1983. I was an archaeologist at the time and I, I was planning on having a career in museums and I was sending out applications one summer out to get a job in a museum. And he said to me, because he was still doing his lecture tours at this time with, with hundreds of dates all over the country, he said, people keep ringing me. The phone's going all the time with people trying to find a print of X, Y and Z from television companies. While you're trying to apply for jobs to get into museums, can you just sit in the office and answer the phone? I say office. This is 22 Islington Green, which was actually his flat where we were operating from for maybe five, six years of our first, when we first started the archive. And I never got that job in the museum. I, I, this, is, this, is, this is where I got stuck when I realised that we could actually... I think our first thought, of course, is we have this vast collection that he's been putting together. And yeah, it was still stuck out in all the garages. And we, we even hired, we rented film vaults out at um, uh, um, Elstree Studios. And they came to an end and we knew we had to go. We, we realised there was expenses involved. We couldn't just have this collection existing. The cans were going rusty, you know. <laughs> but we, we needed store more storage space. And I, I kind of realised that we are going to have to bring some income in to, in order to be able to carry on looking after the collection. The expenses were outweighing and becoming a burden. So I, I suppose in a way, we founded Hunky Film Archives initially in order to pay to keep the collection good. And I suppose you could argue a whole, what is it, 38 years later, we're still doing the same thing. <laughs> we're bringing in income in order to keep the collection good. And that's because the collection keeps getting bigger and we can't keep up. So we keep having to bring in extra money to allow that all to happen. But do you know, I have so many other memories, it's quite difficult to pick a highlight. Probably when we licensed our first film was, I mean, we never really thought, <laughs> we never really thought when we started Huntley Archives that it was possible to do, um, but we did. Of course, we've moved a long way from um, the kind of analogue world. And I suppose one of the biggest difference has to be our attitude towards digital. And I, I'm not sure he'd be terribly comfortable with that. But that's fine, because I'm not sure I'm terribly comfortable with it either. <laughs> um, so, but I do understand, of course, that that is how films are accessed now. And whereas he would still be wanting to fill auditoriums with live audiences sitting there murmuring while they're watching the films on the big screen. What would my father think about Huntley Film Archives now? I think he'd be a little bit appalled because of this lack of organisation that just didn't matter to him. 
But I think he'd be a bit proud as well, I really do, because the collection has grown so much since his days. I mean, he, he had an enormous collection for the 1970s, but here in the 2010s, with material coming into a still, almost weekly, um, sometimes one can, sometimes 500 cans, we never know, know what's going to come through the door. I think he would still love the fact that that process is still happening after all of these years, and um, that's the gift he's given us all. My three events in the games here. I go to the clap on the Wednesday. Now, Harry, we have waited too long for significant. More than 7,000.